Hello, this is the second part of my video series on Canadian history of gun control, and I was gonna have a little bit better lighting, but I fucking broke my Wonder Woman lava lamp bulb. So that's fucking great. Off to a great start. It's not like it's 8,000 degrees in here or whatever. So if you haven't seen the first part of my video series, it's gonna be up here or up here or wherever the fuck it I decide to put it or YouTube allows it. Uh, sorry really hot. But in case you need a refresher, we talked about how the European colonists arrived from uh, those countries over to this land, uh, the expulsion of the Acadians during the French-Indian War, uh, Confederation itself, the restriction of guns to indigenous peoples, the restriction of guns to working class peoples, and then later in the series we talked about the Northwest Rebellion, and also the incredible xenophobia that kind of arose with gun culture and the gun laws and their implementation. We took it right up to 1914. It's a good video. Watch it. So with the onset of the Great War, tons of Canadian men enlisted and died for Britain in an imperialist endeavor. And if you recall from last episode, we talked about how the years prior to World War I, it really solidified it in the public consciousness that imperialism and masculinity were entrenched in gun culture. So if you were into guns, it wasn't a giant leap to go over to Europe and kill for your country. And well, we all know how great the Great War was. But after World War I, we really see a gigantic shift in gun control measures from what was previously established. They were still xenophobic, they were still class-based, but there was a little bit more of a laser focus to it. While the racist execution of gun control laws continued during the Great War, something was brewing near the end of it that the Canadian state had shifted its focus to. See, after World War I had concluded, returning soldiers had wanted their work to give them security and good working conditions, and people who had been working in Canada during the war wanted to get better protections after their employers had raked in the profits. I could actually go into this particular period of Canadian history in its own video because it's so complex, but suffice to say, when the men returned from war, they were mad, they wanted better working conditions, and the employers and the government didn't really want to help them out. Weird how that works. So combine these material conditions with the paranoia of the state and seeing all activists on the left as a potential threat to the status quo, you get crackdowns on all matters of state. But while these attitudes were brewing abroad, there wasn't any inciting incident in Canada that would point towards a communist revolution or communist activity. Anyway, unrelated note, in 1919, the entire city of Winnipeg went on strike and 30,000 workers walked off the job for better working conditions and better living conditions. As you can imagine, two years after the Bolsheviks had hopped on the commie train and railed the Russian system into fucking oblivion, Canada was scared pretty shitless. After six long weeks and an event called Bloody Saturday, the strike was broken by the Canadian government, and immediately after came the Red Scare. Now, Canadian gun control up until this point had been used in a largely discriminatory manner, and of course there was the xenophobia, there was the anti-indigenous sentiment, and there was the anti-lower class sentiment, and as it had shown before in the Northwest Rebellion, they were willing to use these laws against political dissent, but now that Marxism had made the shot heard around the world with the Russian Revolution, they really decided to crack down on it immediately after. While the left consisted of a complex amalgam of groups with often wildly divergent ideas, many Canadians lumped them together and viewed them suspiciously. Security officials worried about their inability to identify people holding communist or Bolshevik views. Alleged radicals could blend into the population, such that security officials began to see the population as a whole as the primary object of attention. So to root out any radical sentiment that was actually brewing in the working class up until this point, Prime Minister Robert Borden and his union government drafted legislation to control guns even more. What was their solution? Require licenses from aliens to own guns. Now remember, in 1913, the government did institute a policy which actually required immigrants to hold a license for handguns, but now that these foreign elements were working to institute critical race theory or whatever, the government decided that this was the fault of alien scum. Now, thankfully, this law as a whole was actually pretty unpopular, and it was repealed in 1921, but it just shows how fast the federal government reacted to this instance of 
mass upheaval and how quick they were to dispense of any possibility of anybody having guns if they were going to be a part of that movement. Now, while we're in the 20s right about now, there isn't too many big pieces of gun control that I felt worth mentioning. And while I plan to go up to the 80s, I want to take a quick detour because there's an event at the end of the 20s that really exemplifies something that we kind of take for granted today. Why do cops have guns? No, seriously, why do cops have guns? Now stop for a moment and seriously consider that. Because in Canada, we could have very easily slid into a system that didn't require every police officer to have a sidearm. Take for example the fact that Hamilton, Ontario may have had privately carried guns by their police in the early 19th century, but they were prohibited from doing so in the late 1870s. The creep of policemen owning guns was slow. Slower than you would have thought. Toronto policemen weren't officially sanctioned to use guns until 1886. Winnipeg police didn't get them assigned until 1911. But that's not even the most surprising part. While the Halifax police force had a reserve of revolvers for emergencies and constables had sidearms, handguns were not standard issue equipment until the early 1970s. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary didn't even carry them until the 1990s. In fact, even prominent institutions and right-wing politicians spoke out about policemen using their sidearms irresponsibly. For a case study, let's focus in on that event at the late 1920s that I referred to earlier. In 1928, a Toronto constable ordered citizen Albert Sampson to stop his car. Sampson refused, which prompted the constable to open fire and kill him. The Toronto Star wasted no time in condemning the police officer who had killed Sampson, publishing, The man who is running away is not at the moment a menace. While trying to escape showed disrespect for the police, that was not a capital offense. Even institutions lambasted the police officer. Chief Justice of the High Court Division of the Supreme Court of Ontario at the time, Richard Meredith, called for a full investigation into the incident, criticizing police who would fire their weapons at people accused of, quote, trifling offenses. My main man, Dick Mary, even went to the Minister of Justice at the time, saying, It requires a great stretch of imagination to hold that petty police officials have power to kill unarmed and unresisting persons without trial for petty offenses only suspected. The death sentence after trial and conviction of the vilest offense is not executed until the Governor General has considered the case and, in effect, confirmed the sentence. But in most of the court cases in that era, courts granted considerable latitude to police officers who fired their weapons. The least surprising information about this tangent is the policeman who shot and killed Sampson received an acquittal, instead of, you know, imprisonment for shooting a man who did stop his car. His car? In 1928? How many were there in Toronto? Fucking five? We're going to pick our story back up in the 1930s, where the world is famously democratic, famously economically stable, and the Prime Minister of Canada instituted a program to help workers. Labor camps. To help them. Surprisingly enough, the Canadian state beginning a program of labor camps wasn't the sign of a very healthy time. R.B. Bennett, who had won the election in 1930 campaigning against William Lyon Mackenzie King, tried to respond to the Great Depression by freeing the markets, raising tariffs to a ridiculously high rate, and starting the aforementioned camps, paying each worker 20 cents a day for a 44-hour work week. In modern money, with inflation, that's $3.84 a day. Big fucking surprise. None of that worked. And everybody hated it. But the labor camps weren't just an excuse to get people working. They were actually a way to crack down on communist organizing that had arose in the material conditions that had happened because of the Great Depression and the responses the government had to it. Because if there's one thing I know that will crush communism, it's implementing anti-worker policies, funneling all these workers into terrible conditions for terrible pay, and then taking radical communist activists and putting it in with them so they can org- Oh, I see the problem here. What this specifically has to do with gun control is that after the 1920s, most laws in relation to it were born out of a fear of a communist uprising that peaked in the 30s. For example, when Tim Buck, leader of Canada's Communist Party, was released from prison in June 1934, he spoke to tens of thousands of Canadians in Montreal and Toronto who had eagerly waited his release. Coincidentally, a national handgun registration was rushed through the House of Commons in 10 days, passing on July 3rd of that year. The RCMP was charged with enforcing and handling this handgun registration essentially since it was passed. This was notable because the provincial and municipal police services had been handling their registries for 21 years with no issue. 
but as Lauren and Carolyn Browning wrote in An Unauthorized History of the RCMP, the federal agency was, quote, the most reliable force in the country for breaking strikes, smashing the radical trade unions, controlling the unemployed, and hounding political dissenters. In the following years, the RCMP and the federal government seized guns from ethnic minorities, and this included Japanese Canadians before Canada had even declared war on Japan, and BC's attorney general refused to register firearms owned by Orientals. So the racism was alive and well. After the Great Patriotic War, Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King abandoned the rifle and the shotgun registry in 1945. However, people with Japanese backgrounds were still banned from owning firearms and ammunition. I don't see any of that for people of German backgrounds. Funny that! Now at the same time, Canada introduced its first official automatic weapons legislation, and it was using the War Measures Act to create an automatic firearms registry. Now this came with problems for even law-abiding gun owners in Canada, and a pattern started to emerge. And judging by the context of everything around it, you can imagine the people who are mostly affected by this. As the Hill Times put it, even if the applicant wasn't demonstrated discretion and good character, the police seized their automatic firearm when it was presented for registration, refused to register it, and ordered it destroyed. On the handgun front, while permit to carry licenses for such weapons allowed Canadians who were registered to carry them on their person out in public until 1969, the prospect of owning one was really lower than would be normally allowed. The reason for this is that one of the requirements of owning a handgun that was implemented and still persists today is the screening of applicants requiring them to be part of a target shooting club. This meant piling the costs of owning and operating a handgun. In 1933, there was an estimated 250,000 civilian-owned handguns in Canada, and only 40% of them had been registered by 1937. This prompted the government to order handgun owners to re-register in 1939 and every five years after. Justice Minister Stuart Garson remarked in 1950 that 35,000 handguns registered in the 1939 mandate could not be found. And to compound that, Ontario Provincial Police in the 1950s noted that there was not a lot of compliance to register their firearms with the government. This may have had to do with the fact that some firearms were immediately snapped up after registration, and stories of that probably spread pretty quick. To punctuate this, there were new regulations introduced in 1951 and 53 that included permits for handguns and automatic weapons. Meanwhile, on the rifles and shotguns front, they would continue to be completely unregulated after World War II. This would continue up into the summer of 1969. But an idea was planted in the public consciousness of the Canadian population in the 50s, and these seeds were what would grow to be the modern gun rights movement that we see today. And as a result of that, handgun ownership actually started to increase in this period. As Brown notes, Canadians possessed a growing number of registered handguns in the post-war period. In 1945, the registry included 222,053 firearms. This figure rose to 359,324 in 1955 and to 530,567 by 1968. Now, this coupled with the fact that in 1951 and 1954, new rounds of permits were issued that you needed to legally own and operate a firearm, the lower classes were continually boxed out from that privilege. Now, it's important to note that in Canada, prior to the 1960s, most of these gun control legislations were actually implemented by the conservative wing of the federal government, although I will say that the liberals had their hands in it too. One point to touch on is that Canada in the 1960s was much like the US, turmoil, racism, and lots of grassroots political action. With this came a large separatist movement in Quebec and the rise of the FLQ. This left-wing grassroots political action was met with a similar reaction as decades past. Gun control. In the summer of 1969, the Canadian government officially defined long guns like rifles and shotguns as firearms. The legislation that contained this was part of a massive criminal law omnibus bill. So while the gun control aspects included uh, eliminating handgun hunting, the carrying of handguns on a person if you had a permit, and introducing restricted and prohibited categories of firearms, it also came with measures such as decriminalized homosexuality and weakened lottery restrictions. The culture that surrounded this new piece of gun control was very typical of the 60s. Because of rising fears of drugs like the dreaded marijuana and the demonic LSD, proponents of gun control connected drugs with crime, both the usage and sale. They suggested that the people who committed crimes with guns did it under the influence or to steal things that would keep their addiction supply coming. Now the interesting thing about this legislation is that it lasted less than 10 years and was replaced in 1977 with Bill C-51, but not that Bill C-51, and it prohibited automatic firearms and required a police permit to own and legally operate any firearm. Now this bill was preceded by another one called Bill C-83 that was shot down in Parliament, but while you may see Bill C-83 and Bill C-51, 
they do have differences, largely the criticisms were about the same. Now, in a damnation of this bill, uh, the Hill Times in a piece called Brief History of Canada's Gun Control Laws, Part 2, 1945 to 1995, they cite an unnamed investigative journalist who said that the law was passed not to control guns, but to control blacks. And I mentioned in the first part, but this should be taken with a grain of salt, especially considering how they didn't cite the name of the journalist or the publication. They just said an investigative journalist. Uh, if anyone can find the original quote, by all means, I couldn't. Since this gun control bill was repealed less than 10 years later, I won't focus too much on it, but I will reiterate that this is the era where gun rights gained dedicated bases, though not radicalized to political action just yet. Hunters groups had slapdash random laws in their respective provinces that required firearm safety training, and with the uptick in Canadians, mostly men, becoming hunters, there were ample breeding grounds for resistance to gun control that would come with the second round of measures. It's just one of those days where you don't want to wake up. Everything is... Everybody sucks. Now, before we get to the actual implementation and passing of 1977's Bill C-51 in relation to gun control and the continuing history of it, we have to talk about the coalitions and organizations that formed in the late 60s and in the 70s to push back against such control measures. Up until the 1970s, there had been no organization that had been formed to represent the issues of those who owned and operated firearms. That changed in 1972, when the Firearms and Responsible Ownership formed in Alberta, largely from the work of Bill Jones, a man who McLean's described as, quote, brash and outspoken with a personal arsenal of 40 weapons. Farrell began as a small organization and never really gained a surplus of members, but they had sway, meeting with MPs to advocate against gun control legislation and in some cases giving testimony before parliamentary committees. In this fight, they weren't alone. NDP MPs from rural districts criticized the 1977 gun control laws, and while the party as a whole wasn't typically anti-gun control, they opposed other aspects of the omnibus bill. Which is ridiculous. I mean, who would oppose giving the government an ability to legally wiretap telephones? Oh, there's the other Bill C-51. But while this section is called Angry White Guys, and most of my comments are going to be on their actions and their activities, it would be disingenuous of me to suggest that they're the only group pushing back against the Liberals' reforms to control guns in this manner. Métis and Indigenous organizations did voice opposition to this bill, including the National Indian Brotherhood and the Native Council of Canada, which represented 750,000 non status Indians and Métis people. The NCA threatened to tell its entire membership to disregard Bill C-83, or alternatively to have them rendered exempt from the laws that would come out of it. So I wanted to point that out to just let you know to keep in mind that guns and gun control are not a solely masculine white phenomenon. Now, as Bill C-86 made his triumphant debut, there was only reasonable responses to a bill that suggested a licensing system, harsher penalties for the criminal misuse of firearms, and the prohibition of fully automatic guns. In 1976, Rego provided alarmist information sheets for customers of sporting goods stores. This may well be your last enjoyable hunting season. Bill C-83 was an extremely repressive bill with open provision for future confiscation of many types of firearms and ammunition. Such comments reflected gun owners' deep distrust of the Canadian political elite. Oh yes, give me that stupid reactionary bullshit we've been dealing with day in and day out for the past 40 fucking years. So yeah, big fucking shock, these reactionary gun nuts decided to call gun control any tiny bit of it a communist conspiracy that they did in Nazi Germany and will result in paddling your swollen ass with fascist, liberal, communist, Nazism, totalitarian, authoritarianism, they're coming to get your guns and they're gonna kill us all. Which brings me to my favorite part of this video, which means I need to get ready for it. Oh yeah, baby! <laughs> Give me that stupid shit. This is how fucking stupid this is all gonna look in just a second. Holy fuck. We're gonna look at some of these stupidest things that these gun right advocates have said to push back against liberal gun control legislation. D.L. Ayton, a president of the Shooting Federation of Canada, said that history taught... The most serious and final obstacle to a totalitarian dictator has always been the ability of a citizenry to rise to its own defense. Tyrants have had, therefore, to devise ways and means of removing all arms from their intended subjects before taking actual control. In this world today, the most menacing force is that of the communist conspiracy which actively promotes gun registration and confiscation. 
He then cited Nazi Germany and then continued, saying, quote, The communist conspiracy or any other tyrant has never been able or dared to take over a single country in which people are armed. So this is the mid-70s with Soviet Russia, China, Cuba, Vietnam, and he still thinks that gun control is a conspiracy to take over everybody's minds and make sure that they can't fight back because nobody's ever fought communists before? <laughs> Let's look at another example. In Orangeville, Ontario, a sporting goods store handed out pamphlets that cited communist rules for revolution. And in that pamphlet, they said that they needed to find a pretext to registering firearms so that they could look with a view, quote, to confiscating them and leaving the population helpless. Let's look at another one. In November 1976, the Alberta Social Credit Party passed a resolution against gun control after an MLA said, Karl Marx's manifesto said, one of the first objectives of any socialist government is to implement gun control. No, it doesn't. The MP for Perry Sound, Muskoka at the time said, one of the first things that a communist does when it takes over a country is to outlaw the ownership of guns. Not usually. Under no pretext should arms and ammunition be surrendered. Any attempt to disarm the workers must be frustrated by force if necessary. Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Now, let's slow down for a bit. I'm not going to go into the history of gun control in the Soviet Union because I'm already doing a video about one country. I don't need to do a whole collective of countries. And I will say that after the Russian Revolution, there were gun control measures implemented. But first they had to fight the Russian Civil War. And Lenin is quoted as saying at the time, An oppressed class which does not strive to learn to use arms, to acquire arms, only deserves to be treated like slaves. We cannot, unless we have become bourgeoisie pacifists or opportunists, forget that we are living in a class society from which there is no way out, nor can there be, save through the class struggle. In every class society, whether based on slavery, serfdom, or, as at present, wage labor, the oppressor class is always armed. Not only the modern standing army, but even the modern militia, and even in the most democratic bourgeoisie republic, Switzerland for instance, represent the bourgeoisie armed against the proletariat. Suffice it to point to the use of troops against strikers in all capitalist countries. Our slogan must be, arming of the proletariat to defeat, expropriate, and disarm the bourgeoisie. These are the only tactics possible for a revolutionary class, tactics that follow logically from and are dictated by the whole objective development of capitalist militarism. Only after the proletariat has disarmed the bourgeoisie will it be able to consign all armaments to the scrappy. And the proletariat will undoubtedly do this, but only when the condition has been fulfilled, certainly not before. So, yeah, maybe disarming people from guns once they aren't needed, but definitely not immediately after taking power, and definitely not after a capitalist government implements gun control. Now, like I said, I am oversimplifying this a little bit, but there's plenty of ample as evidence to suggest that these claims are fucking ignorant and silly and ridiculous and wild and fear-mongering and what the hell? Have they even read the manifesto? What? Not that this will convince the furthest right of all the people watching my video about gun control, the NRA types, we all know how they are. Socialism is when the government does Anyway, it was very apparent from this type of rhetoric that, quite honestly, this was about something more than just hunting or target shooting. And as R. Blake Brown notes in his book, Gun control became a focal point for all this group deemed a riot in society. Government bureaucracy, higher taxes, social policy shaped by Eastern elites, and less emphasis on values such as individual responsibility. Well, I think this is a... <clears throat> oh, fuck. I think this is a fair critique. But I think it ignores the entitlement and the hypocrisy of all these people using these arguments, and they still use them today, to be perfectly honest. They are 
hounding and fear-mongering about the capitalist government implementing gun control to somehow sneak communism in when it has been shown in the past provably that the government uses gun control to disarm leftists and communists. So they're either oblivious to that fact or they're supportive of it, but usually I don't see them even bring that up because if they did, they would be on the same side as the communists in the past and they don't want that. That entitlement is key because in September of 1976, there was a shooting in Toronto after a man bought a rifle and began firing at passerbys before killing himself. It bolstered the Liberal government's attempt to pass this gun control. But the fight wasn't over, and the Canadian Association for Sensible Arms Legislation was one of the organizations that was called into a committee hearing on Bill C-51. And they agreed that the organization as a whole should support recommendations that the Canadian Wildlife Federation had proposed. But the three men who represented the org didn't agree, and they didn't agree publicly in front of the hearing. Fuck. Fuck, it's so hot. I... I accidentally wiped my face because of sweat. Michael Martinoff, Burt Bush, and Bill Jones were the representatives that KSAL took to the hearing, but they didn't present the KSAL position. They presented their own, and it went immediately off the rails. Several members of the committee found him unprepared, contradictory, antagonistic, and unwilling to compromise. He was angry about the decision to classify the AR-15 as prohibited and said he would disregard the law if it declared it so. He was so antagonistic that an MP from New Brunswick told Martinoff to his face that he would rather be in the woods with Elmer Fudd than with you. And while that burn is pretty fucking funky fresh, I do have to point out this interaction that happened between Liberal MP Sima Holt and Martinoff. It really exemplifies how ridiculous this really was. It's just so silly. <coughs> mentioned infringements of your rights and civil liberties of having to purchase a license. I think you referred to the common law and all those nice principles. Can you tell me if you feel it is an infringement on your rights to have a license to drive a car, which is another sort of dangerous weapon too? I am very glad you raised that point. I understand that all the criminals using firearms in Canada last year killed under 1,500 people, but impaired drivers killed about 4,000. I am not asking you that. I admit that the car is a dangerous weapon in the hands of an incompetent or a drunk, and so is a gun a dangerous weapon in the hands of an incompetent or drunk. I know some pretty sleazy people who are not all that sane. Even some in the gun clubs are not all that sane. I want to know if you think it's an infringement of a person's rights to have to buy a license for a car. That's not a very complicated question, is it? Well, if the government would introduce a requirement of an alcohol acquisition certificate to prevent incompetence from drinking before driving their cars, I think the government would then be treating people on par or with firearm owners. But I do not see any great rush to introduce an alcohol acquisition certificate, even though impaired driving as a social problem is far more serious than the misuse of firearms by criminals. But you cannot buy a car without a license. But you can buy alcohol and drive impaired without a license to buy alcohol. You cannot drive a car without a license. Is that an infringement of your civil liberties? Do you not understand English? I am asking you a simple question and you are evading because you have no answer. Unsurprisingly, this tanked KSAL's reputation. Of course it did. This shit's embarrassing. Although if this happened today, we get a bunch of People's Party of Canada members swinging their dicks and screaming about how Martinov owned the libs. So the law passed, and because this resistance was pathetic, it's important to note that the law was never used to limit firearm ownership. Only 0.39% of applications were denied in 1979, 0.52% in 1980, and 0.60% in 1981 and half of the rejected applicants launched successful appeals to their denial. Despite the communist takeover that the right-wing gun lobby feared would take place the second Bill C-51 passed, it was clear that, while it did drastically change categorizations of weapons and the system to process them, it didn't really stop the sale of guns as a whole. But this would all change in 1989, with the highest profile shooting in Canadian history. And unfortunately, it would start the dark cloud of gun violence that Canada has been living under in some form or another, up until today. If you've made it up this far, thank you. I'm glad we had fun. But the next series, the next part in this series, is going to be far more serious. And I can't make as many jokes. So, until next time. Thanks. Hi everyone, thanks for watching my video. I'm sorry it had to end on such a somber note, but uh, really up until 1989, 
you know, you can focus on the, the impotent rage aspect, the, the clumsiness, but the modern era that we live in now is going to be a little bit more serious. So thank you for watching. Hit like, hit subscribe. Um, I'm going to update everybody on the next one. This one took a little bit longer. I've been working hard, doing a lot of organizing. Um, but I'll keep everyone posted about when part three is going to drop. Thanks.